שקר החיים והבל היופי, איש היראת אדוני, היא תתעלל, תנו לה מפרי ידיה, והללויה, ושרי מעשיה. אשת חי ומי ימצא. A woman of excellence who can find. Her value far exceeds that of gems and treasures. Charm is deceptive and beauty is superficial, but a woman who lives her life in awe of God and Torah is worthy of praise. In Jewish homes around the world, it has been a custom for hundreds, if not thousands of years, on Friday nights to sing Solomon's words from the book of Mishle to the women of the household. Not just because it's nice, and not just because it's a fitting way of expressing gratitude to those who, more likely than not throughout our history, were solely responsible for putting together all the preparations for Shabbat. But it has been a tradition to sing these words each and every week because Jewish theology from the rabbinic sages on, has credited Jewish women with being the invaluable propagators not just of the Jewish home, but of Judaism itself. Propagators not just of the Jewish home, but Judaism itself. The spiritual gatekeepers of everything that is our tradition. That means our blessings, our rituals, our music, our Torah. Men, traditionally, in Jewish history have studied, and Jewish women, traditionally, have lived the teachings of those studies. This isn't an apologetic for traditional Judaism, nor is it an attempt to whitewash Jewish history. Because let's be clear, our tradition has, by definition, been patriarchal throughout the great majority of its existence. And therefore, it has been unfair to women at times, and even cruel to women at other times. But even through that historically honest lens, rabbinic Judaism and even biblical Judaism have done something sui generis and remarkable when it comes to world religion. In our tradition in Jewish history, the rabbis and our sages have elevated women to a place of incalculable spiritual worth such spiritual worth that we are required to protect them at all costs. Now, there's a lot more to be said about that. And we could spend not hours but months in the Beit Midrash together digging through the harmonies and dissonances of that theological assertion. And just for the record, I am incredibly on board for that. So if anyone wants to start a study group, seriously, call me or write me after Shabbat, and we can put it together. But this morning, I don't want our focus to be on the nuances or the theory of that theology. I want us to look at the practical application of that belief. And to get straight to the point, I want us to look together at how that practical implication of our tradition, our theology, our belief system is under attack and what we can do about it. This morning, Congregation Shari Tzedek joins with over 900 synagogues and organizations to honor Repro Shabbat, an initiative by the National Council of Jewish Women to help bring attention and action to the issues of reproductive freedom and women's rights. And what that means Jewishly is understanding where those issues fit into our theology. This is too important for us to hint at or approach with subtlety, so let me just say unambiguously what our starting point this morning is. In order to protect women, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, Judaism permits abortion. And going a step further, Judaism not only permits abortion, but in some circumstances requires it, so that at all costs we keep the mother safe and healthy, period. That is halakha. Jewish law is, of course, a living and breathing entity, always open for debate, interpretation, but at least to the rabbis, this issue was unambiguous. 
If women are the spiritual current that keeps Torah in the world, then we do everything in our power to keep them alive, healthy, and safe. But as Jews, we are also asked to look at our world not just through the lens of law, but also through the lenses of mercy, of compassion, and empathy. There is a reason that reproductive freedom and women's rights are not just polarizing issues, but also carry with them intense emotion. There's a reason that when we say these words, this room fills with silence. Very few things in this world are as personal and as painful as the journey of pregnancy. It's true. There are millions of stories, and there are millions of stories being written as we sit here this morning. Some of those stories are stories of rape, of violence, of coercion, of abuse. Some of those stories are stories of poor judgment, of addiction, of naivety, or simple ignorance. And some of those stories are about tragic loss, potential taken from deserving families who couldn't wait to love with all their hearts. And some of those stories are stories of tens of thousands of dollars, test tubes, injections, and repeated heartbreaks, as we hope and pray to be able to have what so many others get to have much easier, or even accidentally. All of those stories deserve to be heard. And all of those stories deserve to be heard with love and compassion. That is what we are asked to do as Jews, to sit with one another, to support one another, whatever pain might come our way. That's what family does. And simultaneously, without paradox, we are also commanded not only to uphold our tradition, but to fight for it. Even when the element of that fight might be hard for us, personally hard for us. Because family comes first. Even when it's painful, family comes first. And our family, the Jewish family, long ago made a theological belief one of the central pillars of our spiritual foundation. A belief that we are here solely because Jewish women have a special and invaluable connection to the divine. One so integral to who we are that we must do anything and everything to ensure their health and their safety. And because that is a tenet of Jewish thought and tradition, we have an obligation to fight against attempts to undermine that belief. So again, because this is too important to address indirectly, what I am saying is that the laws and legislations being introduced in states throughout our country today and the very possibility of Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court is, regardless of how we feel about it on a personal level, a direct assault on religious freedom broadly and Jewish religious observance in particular. And even if there are personal sympathies with the subject of that assault, we as Jews cannot allow for the elimination of religious freedom from this country's constitution. There is simply no scenario where, if such a thing happened, we as a people would not be worse off. As Jews, as Americans, as citizens. This is what we face today. King Solomon wrote that a Jewish woman exceeds the value of any treasures we could imagine. Thousands of years later, the Congregational Minister Henry Ward Beecher wrote that liberty is the soul's right to breathe, and when it cannot take a long breath, laws are girdled too tight. As we sit together in prayer and rest this morning, our soul's right to breathe is being threatened and Eshet Chayel, the theology of Solomon, and our inherent inalienable right to that theology, our theology, is under attack. But we are not powerless. And when we're not powerless, we're not permitted to act like we are. Today is the day of rest. There's 25 hours of peace, of holiness, of goodness, of family. It is a day for celebration, for singing, for praying, for coming together as family to share in our tradition and our love for that tradition. 
but tonight at sundown when those three stars shine in the velvet sky, there will be letters that will need to be written. There will be signs and placards that need to be made. And there will be representatives in Lansing and in Washington whose phones will need to be called. Not to judge or to denounce any particular story, not to unleash hate or to voice personal thoughts on a painful and loaded issue, but to fight for the spirit of America, a spirit that values freedom, a spirit that must value minority religions, a spirit that allows for discourse and disagreement, a spirit that needs to breathe in order to be called a spirit at all. I know this isn't an easy subject. The things that matter most rarely are. And again, I'm not only open to, but completely on board with studying these issues together. But ironically enough, the whole point of what I'm saying this morning is that our ability to study this topic is directly linked with our religious freedom to meet and express our Judaism at all. So on the Shabbat of rights, on the Shabbat of freedom, of justice, let's remember that family comes first. And our family needs to be allowed to be in all of its complexity, with all of its pain, with all of its heartbreak, with all of its ups, with all of its downs, with all of its blessings, with all the spiritual nourishment that comes with who we are, our family needs allowed, needs to be allowed to be. The rest we can figure out. We can figure it out with open minds, with open hearts, with compassion, and with empathy. And we'll figure it out together. Shabbat shalom. We'll continue on page one.